Good morning. Good morning. Happy Halloween. Uh, it's my uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, visiting professor today, uh, Dr. Fabrizio Michelazzi. Uh, Dr. Michelazzi is the Lewis Atterbury uh, Stimson Professor and Chair of Surgery at uh, uh, Well Cornell Medical School. Uh, he's also the Surgeon in Chief at New York uh, Presbyterian uh, Medical Center, and he's been in that role for 13 years. Uh, uh, as uh, many of you know. Uh, Dr. Michelazzi is originally from Italy. He was uh, uh, from uh, Pisa, graduated from the University of Pisa uh, School of Medicine. Uh, he did his uh, uh, a graduate medical education uh, at NYU, uh, completing residency there, and did uh, fellowship at uh, Massachusetts General uh, Hospital. Uh, he's uh, an internationally recognized uh, GI surgeon uh, who's a uh, uh, well-recognized innovator in uh, the treatment of uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, uh, pancreatic cancer, and rectal cancer. Uh, he's a uh, leader in American surgery. He's given uh, more than uh, 40 named lectures, and it's an honor to have you here uh, speaking to us today. He's been uh, a president and uh, president or past president of seven uh, national or regional uh, surgical societies, including the uh, Society for Surgery, the Elementary Tract, the Western Surgical Association, the Central Surgical Association, the Society of Surgical Oncology, and the so Society of Surgical Chairs. Uh, he's a senior director on the American uh, Board of Surgery uh, and past uh, immediate past chair of the American College of Surgeons Board of Governors uh, and is a new regent of the uh, American College of Surgeons. Uh, uh, besides uh, being a, a recognized uh, uh, key leader in American surgery. He's also an international uh, recognized uh, leader on his own right. Uh, he was uh, uh, appointed, selected to the official of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Italy. This is the, at the rank of uh, commendatory, this is the most prestigious civilian award that can be given by the Republic of Italy. Uh, uh, as a subset of that, he uh, was awarded the grand uh, award of Merit. Uh, previous recipients of this award uh, include the current uh, President of Italy, uh, uh, President George W. Bush, and Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi. Uh, uh, in addition to his, uh, to, to his role as a surgeon innovator, uh, he's a very uh, loved and well-respected uh, uh, a surgeon uh, from, from all, and uh, uh, he represents uh, a, a professional kindness, and uh, actually our grand round started last night with a, uh, a very expert and detailed lesson on uh, food and wine, and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelazzi. Thank you very much, Ron, Ronnie. Um, <clears throat> it is a pleasure to be here. Yes, last night was a memorable evening, it was a great uh, dinner, and uh, I really enjoyed meeting uh, uh, residents, uh, new faculty members, and old friends. And uh, indeed, in this room, I count uh, many old friends uh, with whom I spent uh, many, many years uh, at uh, different meetings, the Western Surgical being one, the American College being another one, the American Surgical Association, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for the uh, uh, residents, uh, uh, I have to say that a life in medicine, especially life in academic medicine, allows you to uh, develop the camaraderie and the friendships that really take you through uh, 30, 40 years of uh, career and uh, that really make you uh, smile on, uh, on, uh, on these encounters and, and this, uh, and this ability to uh, foster friendships and collegiality. So um, I decided to talk about rectal cancer and uh, really, uh, as, as we should do nowadays in at the beginning of the uh, third millennium, as my kids frequently remind me, I was born <laughs> last millennium. <laughs> uh, we should really base our treatment uh, on evidence. And there is a lot of evidence in uh, rectal cancer in the last uh, 30 years, and especially in the last uh, decade, that I'd like to go through and uh, offer you, therefore, a glimpse and also a synthesis 
what we know today. So um, let's see, how do I advance the... Um, Oh, here it is. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Thank you. So this is pretty much what I intend to uh, cover in the, uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes. I'd like to go first uh, through seminal studies from the past, uh, say, 20 years, 25 years, which contributed data in favor of uh, accurate oncologic surgery and multimodality therapy. And uh, you'll see that data from starting in 1986 all the way to 2006 cementing these two concepts, optimal oncologic surgery and multimodality treatment. Then we come to the last decade, and I'd like to go through the uh, data provided uh, by the Mercury One study on modern preoperative uh, staging. And then the Mercury Two follow-up study suggesting that uh, good prognosis rectal cancer may be all they need is surgery without the burden and the morbidity of uh, uh, multimodality uh, uh, therapy. I'd like, you, I'd like to give you an update on the current uh, ongoing prospect uh, trial. All the way to uh, August uh, 2016, I'd like to give you a synthesis of the uh, St. Gallen, the second St. Gallen consensus uh, on treatment of rectal cancers, just happened a couple of months ago. And then finally, I'd like to review the results of uh, prospective studies on local excision for rectal cancer, the uh, ECOZOG Z6041. And then the multiple <laughs> studies on minimally invasive surgery for rectal cancer, both laparoscopic and uh, robotic surgery. So it's a lot that we need to cover, but this is all evidence-based. This is the evidence we have today. Maybe incomplete, but this is the evidence we have today. So let's start. It was really 30 years ago to that date that uh, Heald from Basingstoke in England suggested that appropriate uh, surgical oncologic uh, excision of erectile cancer is paramount uh, to having uh, optimal results. And he presented in, uh, he published in Lancet uh, his series of uh, 115 consecutive rectal cancer patients operated on with curative intent over seven and a half years. About 90% of them was a low anterior resection, 10% of them more or less was an APR. And uh, listen to this, at an average of 4.2 years, Postoperatively, there were only three recurrences, pelvic recurrence, for a 2.7 local recurrence rate is a pretty good number. 2.7 is something that uh, even nowadays is what you really aim for, less than 3%. And here are some pictures uh, from a specimen of mine. You can see here, let me see if I can, oh, here it is, perfect. You can see a low rectal cancer removed. This is obviously the extra uh, peritoneal portion of the rectum, a good margin, but most importantly, posteriorly, you can see an intact mesenteric envelope. So the pathologist, when you send the specimen to pathologist, the pathologist uh, can tell you whether the procedure was done appropriately oncologically or not by just looking at the uh, mesenteric envelope posterior. Has it been violated or not? Think, keep this uh, concept in mind, has it been violated or not, because later on I'll show you that if uh, the mesentery is violated, the uh, local recurrence rate increases. So this, is, this meant good oncologic surgery, no chemotherapy, no radiation therapy, and the good oncologic surgery is uh, depicted here is a total mesenteric excision with a five centimeter at least uh, distal margin. Nowadays, I think that uh, the distal margin can be shortened to probably two centimeters, sometimes even less than that, in, in, in order to maintain uh, per, per anal continence. Ten years later, uh, uh, Lars Palman from uh, Sweden uh, presented a study, and this was a different question. Does radiation therapy help results 
help reducing local recurrence rate. These patients are all rectal cancers, stage one to three, from up to 15 centimeters in the rectum, so this is rectal cancers, that did not do total mesenteric ex excision. So here you have a, a case where the surgery was not optimal, and they were randomized to surgery alone versus a short course radiation therapy followed by surgery. And you see there that the local recurrence rate was 11% when radiation and surgery were combined and was 27% when only surgery was combined. 27% is 10 times what a Basingstoke yield did, was 2.7%. So you already realize the power of optimal surgery. From 27%, you go to 2.7%. You also realize that radiation therapy will not help bad surgery because although the results with radiation therapy, the, the, the local recurrence rate was 11% and the difference was statistically significant, 11% is still four times higher than 2.7% obtained with good surgery. Nevertheless, this uh, study put radiation therapy on the map. Maybe radiation therapy was as important as good oncologic surgery. And you need to go to the next study, which is the Dutch study. And the Dutch study was published in 2001. And the main uh, force there is Cornelis uh, van der Velde. And what they did was uh, stage 1-3, like uh, the Swedish study, less than 15 centimeters, like the Swedish study. But all of these patients, uh, well, uh, the, uh, the surgeons were instructed in doing an appropriate surgical procedure, a total mesenteric excision. Now, the patients were randomized to surgery alone versus a surgery after a uh, short course of radiation therapy. And there you have it that uh, if uh, it's surgery alone, the uh, recurrence rate was 8.2%, which is still higher than uh, what... Uh, uh, healed uh, obtained, 2.7. And with additional radiation therapy, it was down to 2.4%, suggesting that there is a s synergy between uh, an oncologically perfect uh, procedure, optimal procedure, and radiation therapy. There was no benefit on the overall survival. And one criticism of this uh, paper is that 24% uh, of specimens, so one in four, the TME was not well done well. And so the mesenteric fascia had been violated. And this is despite an incredible instruction of uh, the surgeons. Surgeons were witness, were proctored for a certain amount of cases before enrolling patients uh, in this very well done and very well constructed study. Now, in Europe, and all the studies uh, with radiation therapy came from Europe, from, from the Netherlands and Sweden, the custom is to do preoperative uh, short radiation uh, uh, course, five days. And so the question is, uh, is it uh, five days of preoperative radiation therapy the same as the traditional five weeks as we do here in the States? And there is one study and other evidence uh, by Buschko published in 2006 in the British Journal of Surgery, where they randomized 312 patients with T3 rectal cancers to receive either preoperative uh, radiation therapy over five days, and then immediately after surgery, or chemo radiation therapy for five weeks, and then a period of uh, six to eight weeks of rest and then surgery. And the results are interesting that the actuarial four-year survival was 67% uh, in one group, 66% in the other one. The disease-free survival was also practically the same. And the local recurrence rate uh, was, uh, there was a difference numeric, but was not statistically significant. Demonstrating, therefore, that uh, you may like the short course, you may like the long course preoperatively, but pretty much the results, the effect is the same. So <clears throat> what next? The question is, should we do it preoperatively or should we do it postoperatively? 20 years ago, 
in the early 90s and mid 90s, we used to do radiation therapy after the surgery. And then someone came up with the idea that maybe it was beneficial to do it before the surgery because uh, the surgery induces obviously trauma to the pelvis, devascularized tissues, and maybe the radiation therapy is not as effective. On top of that, uh, radiation therapy postoperatively may affect negatively the function of the patient. So this is another great study that you should all know. I'm talking to the uh, senior residents, the German rectal cancer study. They randomized uh, 823 patients with a T3 cancer or T4 cancer or with positive stage three positive lymph nodes. And they were randomized to either go through surgery right away, which was performed according to the uh, total mesenteric excision um, uh, 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 principles. Let me just uh, uh, switch my phone off. Followed by radiation therapy and chemotherapy or they are randomized uh, to having a chemotherapy first appear and radiation therapy followed by six weeks of rest and then surgery. And they uh, found out that uh, the local recurrence rate was 6% if the chemo radiation therapy was given preoperatively was 13% if it was given postoperatively. Therefore, giving evidence that if chemo radiation therapy is given, should be given preoperatively rather than postoperatively. This uh, uh, data and these results were confirmed by another study, the NSABP R03, where they randomized 267 patients. And in this particular case, you see that the, the design of the study is pretty much identical to the design of the study of uh, the German study. Um, uh, chemo radiation therapy before surgery followed by surgery or uh, surgery followed by chemo radiation therapy. But in the group that had the chemo radiation therapy preoperative, they also added uh, 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 chemotherapy uh, postoperatively four to seven cycles. And in this particular study, uh, demonstrated that if you give the preoperative, uh, the chemotherapy and radiation therapy preoperatively, and then you follow also with uh, cycles of chemotherapy postoperatively, there is an improved uh, disease-free uh, survival of uh, 65 percent versus 53 percent. There is a trend to a better overall survival, although the difference was not statistically significant. Interesting enough, uh, all patients that obtained a complete pathological response had no recurrence. That's an important uh, uh, concept. About 25% of patients achieved a complete pathologic uh, response with preoperative chemotherapy. None of them developed uh, a, uh, a local recurrence. And the lo local recurrence rate at 10 years was 7% versus 10% uh, in the two groups. This paper was published in 2009 by Mark Rowe. So if you put all these papers in the aggregate, this is 20 years of uh, trials, practically, uh, maybe 25 years of trials. You start uh, with a local recurrence rate approaching 25 30% if bad surgery was done. If you then add uh, preoperative radiation therapy, if you then add preoperative radiation and chemotherapy, if you then add also optimal surgery, the local recurrence rate goes down to about 2 3%. And that's what we should all aim for. And that's what really all the studies listed on the right side of the slide, really in the aggregate, give us the evidence for what we're doing today. So in summary, you can say that the radiation therapy improves local control for T3, T4, N0 uh, disease or N1 disease in distal cancers. Preoperative radiation therapy is preferred to postoperative radiation therapy uh, because of a lower uh, local recurrence rate, trend to better overall survival, 
higher percentage of negative uh, circumferential margin and I might say a better function for the patient. Specific uh, protocol is debatable, but there seems no major difference in outcome with short versus long-term course. And the addition of chemotherapy, this uh, data that I've not shown you, but I'm going to show you now, improves the local recurrence rate. Uh, um, and this is based on a Cochrane analysis of four randomized controlled uh, studies uh, demonstrating that uh, when chemotherapy is added to radiation therapy, there is an increased complete uh, pathological response. There is a lower uh, rec local recurrence rate, although there is no difference in overall survival or uh, disease-free survival. So where do we go from, from here? Well, we st in the last uh, 10 years, we have started questioning the role of radiation therapy. Not because it's not effective, but because maybe we have been over-treating uh, too many patients. And there is a side effect uh, to, uh, to radiation therapy. And you all know what it is. It's a, a higher incidence of fecal incontinence. There is proctitis, especially if it is given uh, postoperatively. Uh, maybe urinary incontinence or sexual dysfunction. Cutaneous perineal problems with uh, radiation burns. And long-term as mobile uh, problems with, such as enteritis, obstructions, and so forth. These are, this is what you pay for if you give radiation therapy and it's justifiable if the patient requires radiation therapy, but maybe not all patients require radiation therapy. And there was a meta-analysis published in uh, 2013 by Loss on Annals of, of Surgical Oncology, where uh, they, the authors uh, gathered uh, some 25 studies and some almost 6,500 uh, uh, patients and uh, demonstrated that patients who received uh, radiation therapy had a higher incidence of uh, inc fecal incontinence than patients that did not receive uh, radiation therapy. So there is a damage to the sphinc sphincter, to the anal sphincter. There is probably some proctitis that uh, really adds to uh, uh, fecal incontinence in these patients. So the question really is, uh, can we narrow the patients to whom we give uh, radiation therapy. And I think that the last 10 years, this has been the main question that has been, we have tried to address. Now, why, who, who are the T3 patients that require radiation therapy? Great study done by Nuttegal, a pathologist uh, from Amsterdam, and remember that Cornelis van der Hel the one who ran the Dutch trial is from Amsterdam. She reviewed the data retrospectively of the Dutch trial. And uh, uh, all those uh, specimens have been uh, sliced like a, a bread slicer. And uh, if you take a, a rectal specimen with a rectal cancer and you slice it like a, like a bread, you form all these uh, donuts or circumferential donuts where it becomes kind of uh, clear, if I see the cursor it is, where the tumor is. And here is a, you can see this white being the tumor. And obviously you know that, for instance, in this particular spot, that tumor does not reach the, uh, the, uh, the circumferential margin. But if you go, and I lost the cursor here, oh, here it is. If you go up here, for instance, the tumor extends all the way to the circumferential margin. And as a matter of fact, here you can notice there are some satellite tumor deposits that practically touch the uh, circumferential margin. Does that make a difference? And what she did, she looked at the local recurrence rate based on the factors that you see up there in that particular yellow band. And so if... Uh, the uh, circumferential radial margin was positive, the local recurrence rate was 16.4%. If the tumor approached the circumferential rectal margin when between zero and two millimeter was practically 15%. If the tumor was uh, 
between two and five centimeters from the circumferential margin, the local recurrence area was 10%. With the tumor now being between five and 10 centimeters away from the circumferential margin, the local recurrence rate dropped to 6%, and if the tumor was more than one centimeter away from the circumferential margin, the local recurrence rate dropped to 2.4%. And she suggested that tumors should also be uh, uh, designated by a subscript uh, A, B, C, D, where A is a tumor that uh, grows only two millimeters uh, out of the uh, muscularis, uh, B is a tumor between two and five millimeter, C is a tumor five to 10 millimeters, and D is a tumor that uh, is uh, more than uh, 10 millimeters uh, growing out of the muscularis and uh, of the rectum, therefore out of the rectal wall. Um, you remember I told you if uh, surgically you violate the circumferential rectal margin or if by any chance that tumor has extended to the circumferential rectal margin, what does it happen? This is a very busy slide, but what I, and Dr. Cyrenik says, yes, is a very busy slide. <laughs> <laughs> I know, <laughs> and it's 7.15 in the morning, so, <laughs> so let me simplify for you, <laughs> okay? Look at the bottom. It says CRM stands for circumferential rectal margin. The first column to the, your left is overall survival. All those little dots are to the left of the median line, means worse overall survival if the circumferential rectal margin is positive, either because the tumor is big or because you had surgery, have violated the, the mesentery, and uh, you have exposed the tumor. This middle column is circumferential rectal margin and distant metastasis. There are more distant metastasis in uh, <coughs> patients with tumors going all the way to the uh, circumferential rectal margin or potentially where you violated. And the last uh, column, on your right is circumferential rectal margin and local recurrence rate. There are more local recurrence rates if the tumor extends to the circumferential rectal margin uh, or if uh, it has been violated at surgery. And this is uh, practically, this is a collection of 20 studies over the past uh, 20 years uh, showing that. So the circumferential rectal margin is very important, which leads us to the Mercury study. This is a study that the residents need to know about. This is uh, 408 consecutive patients with complete pathologic and radiological imaging, and the imaging was mainly MRIs of the pelvis. It was published uh, in the British uh, Medical Journal in 2006. And uh, what they did, the radiologists there, they tried to correlate the radiological imaging with the pathologic uh, findings, trying to figure out on MRI the distance to the circumferential rectal margin, whether there was extra mural vessel invasion, whether the lymph nodes were positive or negative, the, the spread of the tumor, the, 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 the death of the tumor, and, and so forth. And uh, they enrolled uh, some 408 patients in, in, in a short period of time, not even two years, in 11 colorectal units across uh, Europe. And uh, in those 408, they predicted that uh, in 349, the uh, uh, circumferential margin was negative by MRI, and it happened that uh, of those 349, in 327, this, uh, at surgery, at pathology, the margin was indeed uh, negative. So with a predictive uh, uh, rate, of something like 94%. So the MRI, that's how the MRI nowadays of the pelvis has really established itself as the radiological modality to stage patients locally preoperatively. They also uh, looked at uh, the incidence of uh, local recurrence rate if extramural venous invasion was present or negative or absent, and you can see there that the local recurrence rate at four and a half years really changes dramatically if there was no extramural venous uh, invasion, less than 10%, and 
And if there was extramural venous invasion, probably in the order of about 25, 30%. So the margin and the presence of extramural venous invasion put these patients at a higher risk of local recurrence. Keep this in mind. Because what they did, they follow up with what's called the Mercury 2 study. And based on what I already told you, they were able to divide their patients in two cohorts of patients. Think about, let me see if I can go through the cursor. Think about this group here, where on uh, MRI, the circumferential rectal margin is negative, and we know that there is a predictive value of 94%. The tumors are either T1 or T2 or T3, A or B. So that means that the tumor has grown only, at the very most, uh, between 0 and 5 millimeters out of the rectal wall, not more than 5 millimeters. And there is uh, no extramural venous invasion. So this is a cohort of good actors, not bad actors. Those patients send them directly to surgery. On the other hand, if uh, preoperatively the uh, uh, circumferential margin is involved or is not involved but these tumors are T3, C and D, so more than five centimeters are growth outside of the rectal wall or they're T4, so they're really full thickness or there is a, a, a venous invasion, those patients should receive preoperative radiation therapy. And they ran the numbers on their own experience. And indeed, going back to the Mercury One trial, they divided uh, those cancers, those uh, 400, or 408 uh, patients that they had data on 374, they divided these 374 in two groups. The good prognosis cancers, 141, and the poor prognosis cancer, the one, 234. Of the 141, this was a retrospective review of a prospective study. Of the 141 good prognosis patients, 122 had indeed gone directly to surgery, and they were able to calculate the uh, overall survival and the disease-free survival of five years, which was 68 and 85 percent respectively, with a local recurrence rate of only 3.3%, establishing the concept that in the appropriate patients with an early rectal cancer, you can go directly to surgery, and if you perform optimal oncologic surgery with a total mesenteric excision, you obtain the same data, the same results, 3.3% local recurrence rate, as he healed obtained in 1986. There will be a cohort of patients that have uh, more aggressive tumors, the poor prognosis cancers that probably nowadays you should uh, radiate preoperatively and give chemo radiation therapy preoperatively. Recently, a question has been asked whether preoperative chemo could replace preoperative radiation therapy because, uh, again, uh, radiation therapy has side effects and nobody really likes to have those side effects that follow the patients for life. This was a uh, little abstract published in 2010 and presented at uh, ASCO in 2010. 31 uh, patients with rectal cancers, stage two or stage three. They receive uh, uh, fall fox and avastin preoperatively, no radiation therapy. Of these 31 patients, two patients developed cardiovascular toxicity and makes 29 patients. Of 29 patients, 27 completed the preoperative chemotherapy and had surgery. And of those uh, 27, all had tumor uh, regression and uh, all had an R0 resection. And as a matter of fact, one fourth of them had a complete pathologic response, so a very good response. After all, you achieved what you really want to achieve with preoperative uh, 
uh, treatment, which is the ability to have a, an R0, a, a, a resection without a positive margin. So <clears throat> to a certain extent, this abstract gave the basis of the ongoing prospect trial. Why is it called prospect? It's a difficult thing to remember. It's preoperative radiation or selective preoperative radiation and evaluation before chemotherapy. That's prospect trial. But forget about the name and what it stands for. The prospect trial, which is uh, currently enrolling patients, and by the end of July, when I last uh, I checked, 605 patients had been already uh, enrolled out of 1,000. 1,008, I believe, is the number that needs to be uh, enrolled. These patients are randomized one-to-one uh, -one in two groups. One is the standard arm at the bottom of the uh, slide, whereby the patients, uh, and I'll find the cursor, patient here receive, uh, uh, receives uh, 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 you know, uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, followed by surgery according to the uh, total mesenteric excision, followed by the uh, false box for eight cycles. That's the standard treatment. And this standard treatment is uh, um, compared to uh, a, 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 another arm where patients receive false uh, fall fox for six cycles, and then they are restaged. And if there is a response of more than 20% in the restaging, they go to surgery, followed by fall fox times six, without any radiation therapy. If the response is less than 20%, they received a combined modality therapy of chemo and radiation therapy, then they go to surgery, then they receive Folfox N2. So again, this is one way to potentially differentiate good actors from bad actors on the way they respond to initial chemotherapy with the ability, therefore, to avoid altogether radiation therapy. These prospect trials, obviously, the uh, the data uh, is not available yet. They continue to accrue. I think that they will have to wait a few years to have the, the answer to this uh, question. Let me just fast forward you to uh, August, this past August in St. Gallen, a beautiful little uh, town in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, there was uh, the second uh, URTC consensus, and uh, many uh, individuals from all over the world uh, participated to that. Many things came out of that consensus, but I think that two are important to our discussions. Um, one is that the optimal pre-therapeutic staging uh, should be based on magnetic resonance imaging. And for early T1 cancers, the combination of MRI and endoscopic ultrasound is uh, considered superior because of the superiority of uh, endoscopic ultrasound for very small tumors. And the second uh, important point that came out of the consensus uh, conference is that primary surgery with TME is recommended, was recommended by most uh, for early tumors with limited risk of recurrence, uh, which are the T1 tumors, the T2 tumors, or the T3 tumors, stage two, so no positive lymph nodes, and A, so very, very small growth, less than two millimeters out of uh, the rectal wall, with clear mesorectal fascia on MRI and clearly above the levator's muscles, these patients can go directly to surgery. So I think that we're chipping at uh, the group of uh, advanced tumors where we can spare some patients from the toxicity of uh, uh, radiation therapy one way or the other. And finally, let me ask you, uh, let me uh, answer this question. Uh, we have seen that in 26%, 25% following chemo radiation therapy, or sometimes even just chemotherapy, there is a complete pathologic response. What should we do for those patients, especially for those patients that have a, a rectal cancer that is so low that you on, on, the only surgical alternative is an abdominal perineal resection, therefore condemning those patients to uh, a colostomy for life. What should we do? And uh, Angelita Abergama, 
in 2011 at the uh, American Surgical uh, Society presented uh, her uh, experience with 67 patients with uh, complete pathologic response where she took an observational attitude to these patients and see what happened and follow these patients every three months with a rectal examination and biopsies. And uh, in her data, five per she achieved a 5% overall survival, 96%, a five-year five uh, disease-free survival, 72%, and she had 21% local recurrences at uh, five years, more or less. They're all amenable to salvage therapy. This is the paper that makes a, a cogent argument for observation when you treat a patient with a very low rectal cancer that has obtained a complete pathologic response after neoadjuvant therapy and where the surgery would end up in a permanent colostomy. I have to caution you that other papers have not shown the same very good results, so the question is still out on what to do on these patients, but I think that if you are confronted with an 82-year-old with a lot of comorbidities, unable probably to sustain uh, a major abdominal perineal resection, this uh, paper at least justifies a, uh, an observational attitude for that particular patient. Um, let me just go to the bottom of this. We have covered all these points so far. Give me five minutes and we'll review the results of uh, prospective studies on local excision of rectal cancers, the ECOZOG Z6041. And then we'll ask the question whether a minimally invasive approach to rectal cancers is justified and whether the results after minimally invasive surgery are as good as after uh, open surgery. So let's, let's go on to the first one, which is the local transanal treatment of uh, T2 tumors. And if you look at the past literature, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, uh, uh, Memorial, if you look at local excision of T2 without any chemo and radiation therapy, you probably have recurrences in the order of about 20 to 35 percent. And so this study was designed to add chemo radiation therapy to these patients with T2 cancers, low cancers, and do a local excision and see whether the local recurrence rate and the overall survival would be acceptable. And this is, again, Ken is another very busy slide, but let me just uh, summarize. Um, a total of uh, 79 patients over many years, uh, from 2006 to uh, 2009, and I, I believe from a, a, a huge amount of centers, uh, probably 30 centers, 35 centers. So no center really did, uh, uh, these are rare cases. So every center, one, two, three, four, but uh, not a great amount. But altogether, we were 79 patients. These are patients with clinical T2N0 rectal adenocarcinoma by endorectal ultrasound and uh, MRI. And those are the favorable ones. You know, when you go, you sit for the boards and uh, we ask you, okay, you want to do a transanal resection, which tumors uh, are you going to get? Well, select, those are the best tumors. Those are the ones that at the very most are three to four centimeters in diameter. Those are the ones that uh, probably involve less than 30% uh, of the circumference of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the rectum. And obviously a T1, in this particular case, there are T2, located within eight centimeters of the anal verge. And in this particular study, the ECOG performance status was at least a two. They received chemotherapy, and they uh, received radiation therapy, and then they underwent a transanal excision. And these data were published uh, last year by uh, Garcia Aguilar, Jose uh, uh, Garcia Aguilar, who works at now at uh, Memorial Sloan Catherine. And the estimated uh, three-year disease uh, survival was 88% and uh, for the intention to treat group and 86%, 87 for the uh, per protocol group. 
And the author themselves give this uh, statement uh, in the uh, discussion, and I'm reading for them. Observe that three-year disease-free survival was not as high as anticipated. Our data suggests that neoadjuvant chemo radiation therapy followed by local excision might be considered only in patients with uh, clinically staged T2 NZ tumors, NZ tumors who refuse an abdominal perineal resection or are not candidates for transabdominal resection. So transanal for T2 is still not standard of care. It's only for specific uh, patients, a specific cohort of patients. Either they refuse a colostomy or they are not fit enough for an abdominal perineal resection. Okay, last uh, thing. Uh, should we do it laparoscopically or should we do open? Are we jeopardizing the chances of uh, cure for a patient if we do it laparoscopically? And there are a lot of studies now that give the answer. First of all, there is a Cochrane analysis published in uh, April 2014, collating 14 studies uh, with more than 3,500 patients. They showed there was a similar disease-free survival and local recurrence rate, whether the patients were done open or laparoscopically. But most importantly, there are five completed randomized control studies and one accruing. The one accruing is from...